Go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the cost reduction efforts across the organization. Our infrastructure segment profit of $90 million has recovered faster than we expected, from just over $20 to $40 per barrel in June. This increased the opportunities available to the crude oil marketing business and improved margins at our Moose Job facility. The response in crude oil price resulted in higher volumes than we anticipated for the quarter at Hardesty. And we also saw the results of our cost reduction efforts across the organization. Our infrastructure segment profit of $90 million really demonstrates its resilience. Taking out the efforts, the effects of our uh, moose jaw turnaround, it was a very modest decrease from a record first quarter in our infrastructure segment. Volumes at Hardesty recovered to pre-COVID numbers in June and our Edmonton terminal was unimpacted. Marketing also had a great quarter with a segment profit of $44 million. As mentioned above, crude oil prices moved up to $20 in the quarter. Utilizing our tankage at Moose Jaw and Hardesty, we were able to capture higher contango opportunities than we expected at the last earnings call. With both business segments doing well, Adjusted EBITDA came in at $143 million and distributable cash flow at $94 million. These are both new high watermarks for Gibson. Again, I'm proud of how the organization responded in controlling cost and commercially. One area that we actually saw an impact in COVID was in our commercial discussions. With the swift drop in commodity prices, discussion pause. Most of these discussions have resumed, but it has set back many of our negotiations. However, we do not see this lost time impacting our 20, our 200 to $300 million capital spend next year. We continue to expect to sanction two to four tanks a year. However, due to COVID and the pause in negotiations I mentioned, this year a tank or two could slip into next year. With the, with, the, with the continued progress of TMX towards a Q1 2023 in-service date, we expect customers will need to secure their corresponding tankage at Edmonton sometime next year. We have room for about 2 million barrels at the Edmonton terminal, and we feel we're very well positioned to compete with the other terminals in the area for that needed tankage for TMX. We've also resumed discussions for additional phases at the DRU. Interest is coming in from both the producers in Canada and the refiners down in the States. With the pause in discussions and given the complexity of the agreements required with this DRU to put together the whole value chain in place, we expect the sanction of another phase will be sometime next year. As I mentioned earlier, oil sands volumes through Hardesty are back to normal. It's on the conventional side of our business where we've seen a more persistent impact and a slower recovery. As a result, we expect the capital outside the fence in Canada will remain limited. In the U.S., we're finishing out our existing capital program and are well positioned to continue to grow when Permian drilling restarts. For 2020, we have reaffirmed capital growth at around $300 million. Given we're already in August, any capital approved through the balance of the year would largely be filling out next year's program. The remaining spend this year is mostly at the DRU and the three tanks at the top of the hill there in Hardesty. These two projects are progressing well. We expect one of the tanks will be placed in service in October and the other two sometime in December. The DRU continues to progress forward, and we remain on track for that mid-2021 startup. There are two other achievements in the quarter I'd like to briefly touch on. First, in May, we released our inaugural sustainability report. We see this as a major step in our journey, in our ESG journey. 
We're currently working on our first mission to CDP this summer. We continue to embed ESG principles into our daily decision making, our strategic planning, and our capital allocation processes. Second, the refinancing of our notes was a major win. Interest savings will be around $16 million per year. With the savings from the refinancing last year, we have exceeded our target when we became investment grade of realizing 15 to $20 million in interest savings. In summary, we had a great second quarter. We continue to execute and we remain well positioned. The second quarter demonstrates the resilience of our terminals business and the capability of our marketing organization to find opportunities in nearly any market. We have resumed commercial discussions and we see further growth for our infrastructure business. We continue to expect to sanction two to four tanks on an annual basis and deploy 200 to $300 million or more per year. And our financial position is very strong. We are fully fully to leverage and pay out well below our target ranges. I will now pass the call over to Sean, who will walk us through our second quarter results in more detail. Sean? Thanks, Steve. I would very much agree with Steve that we are pleased with how resilient our infrastructure business was in delivering total segment profit of $90 million in the quarter. Clearly, oil prices and volumes recovered much quicker than our outlook on our call in early May assumed. With respect to the different components of our infrastructure segment, our terminals were effectively in line with the first quarter after adjusting for some of the upside volume fees and spot train loading in that quarter. Contribution from our Canadian small terminals and pipelines was down about 40%, which was still slightly above our expectations. In the U.S., volumes increased slightly through the quarter as we completed several tie-ins into our Piot system, with shut-ins not being a driver, resulting in an increase in contribution to segment profit over the first quarter. At Moose Jaw, the turnaround was completed on schedule and slightly below expected cost. As a result, we experienced less than half of that $5 million quarter over quarter decrease in segment profit we initially expected due to the turnaround. We'd expect that segment profit from infrastructure will continue to increase through the remainder of the year, which would also imply that we'll, we will likely come in towards the upper end of original range of 360 to $380 million in infrastructure segment profit for the year. With the three tanks coming into service at the top of the hill in the fourth quarter, we remain confident in achieving the quarterly run rate of approximately $100 million exiting 2020, or $400 million on an annual basis that we've previously guided towards. The rapid recovery in crude oil prices was also very beneficial for marketing, which was able to deliver $44 million in segment profit. As we talked about on our last call, with a steep contango in the forward curve and access to storage at Moose Shaw, as well as at our terminals, we are able to participate in that opportunity. The quarter saw limited contribution from refined products given the extended turnaround. But as the market normalized towards the end of the quarter, we saw improving demand for the heavier ends, so distillate remains fairly weak. In terms of our outlook for the third quarter, we'd expect segment profit to be around the midpoint of our long-term run rate range of 20 to $30 million. Our current forecast would also anticipate that marketing adjusted EBITDA will be fairly close to segment profit in the third quarter, though that gap could widen to the extent that we see another, large, another larger move up or down in crude oil prices, and if we wait crystallizing our existing positions to the fourth quarter. With marketing segment profit of approximately $80 million through the first half of the year, and the third quarter guidance of 20 to $30 million, we clearly now expect to be well above the full year guidance of approximately $100 million we provided on our first quarter conference call. We are not going to update that number at this time, so simple math would point to full year results above the high end of our long-term run rate guidance of $120 million. Returning to the second quarter results, with both infrastructure and marketing delivering strong segment profit contributions, and adjusting out a $20 million non-cash unrealized loss in financial instruments within the marketing segment, 
Adjusted EBITDA of $143 million represents an all-time high for a single quarter. For context, that's a $14 million or 11% increase over the first quarter of this year and a $34 million or 32% increase over the comparable quarter last year. And importantly, more than half of that increase was driven by the growth of long-term stable cash flows from our infrastructure segment. G&A in the quarter was $8 million, which is slightly below the $10 million a quarter run rate we budgeted at the start of the year. Though we remain focused on minimizing costs in this environment, it's likely too early to assume a permanent lower rate going forward, as while there are clearly savings on items like travel, there are additional costs in the COVID environment to facilitate working from home, though that's definitely the outcome we're driving towards. Quickly working down to distributable cash flow on a sequential basis, the second quarter figure of $94 million was $8 million above the first quarter of 2020, and as Steve mentioned, also a record for a single quarter. Replacement capital of $8 million in the second quarter was $2 million higher, with a portion of the spend during the quarter a result of an unplanned remediation project identified during a regular inspection. Even with the unplanned remediation work, we still very much expect to be in or around the $25 million number we budgeted at the start of the year. The remainder of the cash outflows during the quarter, such as interest, taxes, and lease payments, were all consistent with the first quarter. Given our distributable cash flow this quarter was $14 million above the second quarter of last year, the payout ratio decreased to 60%, which is well below our 70 to 80% target range. As well, our debt-adjusted EBITDA decreased to 2.4 times, well below our three to three and a half times target. While we have seen a partial recovery in the business environment, our bias will continue to be towards maintaining a conservative financial position. Consistent with that, we believe it is important to maintain access to significant liquidity. At the end of the quarter, we are only $80 million drawn on our credit facility with a similar amount of cash on the balance sheet. Effectively, we have access to the full $750 million credit facility, as well as to over $100 million in unutilized capacity on our $150 million bilateral demand facilities. We also remain fully funded for all our sanctioned capital expenditures. And with the continued outperformance of our business in the second quarter, we continue to build some cushion on that position. Given our outlook for capital in 2020 of about $300 million, we will almost certainly carry out some funding capacity into 2021. Subsequent to the quarter, we are able to further improve our financial position by both extending the term of our maturities and reducing our interest costs. By refinancing our 5.25% 2024 notes with two tranches bearing an average coupon of 2.65%. We are cutting our annual interest costs on that $600 billion amount almost in half while also extending the average maturity by two years. Through this refinancing, as well as the one completed in September of last year, the weighted average coupon on our notes would be by far the lowest within our Canadian mid-sized peer group at just over 3% while at the same time having the second longest weighted average tenor. Also, in late July, S&P confirmed our investment grade rating and stable outlook. With that, we've now had both credit rating agencies reaffirm the ratings and outlooks following the COVID outbreak. In summary, the business had a very strong second quarter. To the extent that we see bumps in the economic recovery over the remainder of the year, we remain well positioned with a resilient business, as was evidenced in our results this quarter. We have market-leading quality of cash flows, a strong balance sheet, and are more than fully funded. At this point, I will turn the call over to the operator to open up for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to ask the question, you will need to press star then one on your telephone. To remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Again, that's star one to ask the question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Jeremy Tonette with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Jeremy. just wanted to start off with the, the marketing segment here. Um, when you back out kind of the mark-to-market noise, 
it seems like uh, you guys actually hit $64 million for segment profit in the quarter. And so just wondering off that, you know, a few questions. You know, in the quarter that was thought to be, you know, pretty difficult among the worst quarters there, uh, you hit 64. Why do you think 80 to 120 is the right kind of guidance run rate for the uh, for that segment? Um, what, what drove it that high? I mean, wondering if you could provide some incremental color or I guess what's not going to happen in 3Q where you think you're only going to hit 20 to 30 in 3Q when you posted such a, a strong mark in uh, 2Q? Well, I mean, I, you know, our segment profit was 44, and our adjusted EBITDA was uh, uh, around that 66 number. And then, you know, we've kind of guided to that 20 to 30, kind of that midpoint of that 20 to 30 on the segment profit next next quarter, and within that range on adjusted EBITDA in the third quarter. Uh, you know, at the last call, we, we said that there was a large contango opportunity uh, developing and that we had significant storage at our Moose Jaw facility and some, some storage at our Hardesty facility. And to the extent that we'd be able to take, it, take advantage of that arbitrage opportunity, we would. And after the call, uh, crude oil continued to drop significantly. And so we were able to capture our larger uh, arbitrage than we expected at the last earnings call. You know, in the second quarter, you know, we're, we're – you know, as far as a marketing and trading organization, we're well through over half of the quarter, and the quarter's been very much range-bound uh, around that $40 a barrel. And differentials have been very much range-bound. So volatility always helps in the marketing organization. Uh, but we did carry over segment profit and, and have captured profit in the second quarter already, and that's why we're confident in that 20, 20 to 30 range. The third quarter, um, you, you know, we didn't give any real guidance there other than, you know, we just continue, we believe we'll continue to find opportunities in any market, uh, either through our Moose Jaw facility or through our Hardesty or Edmonton assets or even down in the States around our Wink Terminal, which will start up, uh, really start to start up in September as far as connectivity to downstream pipelines. Got it. Thanks for that. And then maybe just kind of building off of the opportunities that could present themselves here. I mean, if you, the marketing has done better than expected for some time here, that's, you know, really improved the strength of the balance sheet. The leverage is, at, you know, quite a, a low place right now. And it seems like you guys have some balance sheet capacity maybe to be a little bit on the offense here, whereas maybe you guys have the opportunity for some bolt-on acquisitions that could be small in nature and, and helpful to you. And on the other side of the coin, you know, other midstreamers, particularly in the U.S., uh, are, are kind of in more difficult shape right now and might need to kind of divest in smaller assets to help out there. Just wondering, you know, how you think about that dynamic and that opportunity set right now. I mean, it's it's really nice to have the balance sheet that we have in this current uh, environment. Um, as far as opportunities, we've always been pretty leery of uh, doing M&A um, because, you know, the one thing we do want is that sustainable cash flow that we have today. And so any kind of M&A, we'd be really looking for the sustainability of cash flow on a long-term basis uh, and additional growth platforms. Um, but right now, we haven't seen any really kind of develop that, that fit our strategy today, Chairman. Got it. So if M&A or capital uh, deployment opportunities don't materialize, I guess, would repurchases kind of, uh, you know, make sense as the next place to, to put that capital? Yeah, I mean, that certainly is an opportunity. But, you know, we, we feel pretty confident on our, on our capital growth program. Uh, you know, we said that 200 to 300 next year. Um, and, uh, you know, we feel like we can continue to deploy that 200 to 300 on, you know, as we go out just on our existing platform. Um, but, uh, we're going to take a harder look at our strategy throughout the remainder of the year and work with the board and see if there are opportunities, uh, to, to adjust that strategy in the future. But right now we're very confident in, in what we do and, the, and, uh, how, how we've executed on our strategy. Great. Thank you uh, for taking my question. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from the line of Ben Pham with BMO. Your line is open. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, I was wondering, you guys mentioned a couple of high-level impacts from COVID-19, moose drug, that uh, all this being not as, as bad as impacted conventional, seeing a bit of pressure. Uh, as you look at the last three months, uh, are you able to, to quantify or you look at quantifying the impact from COVID-19 in terms of EBITDA? And then to that, is there, do you think there's some sort of situation or where uh, marketing was some sort of a hedge for you guys here where infrastructure got, got hit a bit, but then marketing was, was stronger than expected that you ended up uh, marketing acting as sort of a hedge to COVID-19. Hey, Sean, why don't you take that one? Yep, yep, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Uh, I mean, as you heard in our prepared remarks, um, if you think about the impact of COVID-19, I mean, certainly there was uh, some impact in our infrastructure segment. Um, you know, you go through the you know, prepared remarks, uh, you know, volumes actually recovered a bit quicker than we expected at our terminals. Uh, so those effect ended up effectively in line with the first quarter after adjusting for some of the items that happened in the first quarter. Uh, certainly felt an impact from Canadian small terminals, uh, which was down you know, roughly 40% in the quarter. Uh, as we discussed, U.S. volumes actually increased slightly through the quarter, so no real impact there. Uh, and at Moose we did have an extended turnaround, though that came in uh, below expected cost, so the impact was less than what we would have expected on the first quarter call. Um, you know, it's tough to really say for the marketing business, given it's more of an opportunity-driven business and around the COVID impact, but we, we absolutely had a strong quarter. Uh, I don't know if I'd ne necessarily say that our marketing business acted as a hedge for our business. I think we have a strategy to focus on crude oil infrastructure and to optimize in around that assets and have assets that complement it, optimize it, or help it grow. I think, you know, this quarter you really saw that. We had a somewhat muted impact from COVID-19. We thought we actually had a, you know, relatively strong infrastructure quarter, and we had a very strong marketing quarter. So I don't know if I'd necessarily characterize marketing as being a hedge rather than just, you know, taking advantage of opportunities that were in the market, you know, because of our infrastructure assets. Okay, that makes sense. Um um, can, can I ask you then, you, you always talk about and done a good job of providing us the, the blue sky scenario on, uh, on your, your storage uh, opportunity, your, your access to land, and just, just the size of that being decades in, in the running there. Um, what's your commentary on the blue sky for DRU? Like when you think about the rail capacity and ability to expand your, your land, uh, the size of the land position. You mentioned phase two maybe next year, but like how, what type of running room do you have beyond that? So Ben, um, so you look at the facility. The facility is going to be set up to build five um, 50,000 barrel a day DRUs. So that's the initial design. So all the infrastructure into and out of the facility is designed to meet that kind of 250,000 barrel a day feed rate. And, you know, the ConocoPhillips agreement was that first 50. Um, now, we have significant land near uh, position. Us and USD have significant land positions up there by the, the HERC unit train facility. Uh, so the 250 limit was designed because that's kind of the capacity of that little over three unit trains a day. Now, we can build another unit train track and continue to add on DRUs. There's really uh, really not a lot of limits in our capacity to develop that other than the need in the market. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Mike, Matt Taylor with Tudor Pickering Holt. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks for taking my questions here, guys. Um, on new tankage, uh, Steve, you mentioned one of the two tanks may slip into 2021. So uh, can you just give us some updated thoughts uh, on that two to four tank range? Is it fair to say that you're expecting to be sort of in the bottom end of the range? And then is there any reason why you think that would change, maybe extended COVID implications or lockdowns? Any comments here on that would be helpful? So, Matt, if you kind of look at us last year, we, we contracted kind of the 
we contracted two tanks late, like in mid-December. Uh, so it was pretty close last year. And this year, you know, as far as negotiations go, um, we feel really comfortable. It's really about the com- how comfortable are our customers uh, in entering obligations right now. They, they, they see the need for the tankage, and there's a timing. It's just timing issues. So the two to four tanks uh, is really a nominal barrier. It's something nominal that we throw out there. And over time, we believe that we'll, we'll, we'll build those two to four tanks at Hardesty. Um, so we're still pretty comfortable. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, things took a pause for about two to two, a little over two months in commercial negotiation. And so with that, we're just trying to, we're just trying to be conservative in what we say um, to make sure we do what we say we're going to do. Um, we're very excited, really, what's happening at Edmonton, uh, you know, because TMX uh, continues to progress forward. We have numerous customers of ours, existing customers at Hardesty, that we're definitely t- that we are discussing additional tankage at Edmonton and support them on their uh, as, as on their their uh, long haul contracts on TMX. So we can build two million barrels of tanks there at Edmonton to support that, and uh, I would say we're talking to five or six different potential customers currently on building out the rest of our footprint there at Edmonton. Great. That, that, thanks for that, Steve. That's helpful. Just to follow up to that, um, what proportion of, of this growth or, or these tankage uh, ads are you expecting to contract internally, and, and is your thinking on that shifted a little bit as production is recovering, and what I mean by that is would you be willing to do um, you know, maybe some additional tankage uh, internally that maybe you would otherwise have reserved for third party or just sort of the mix, commentary on the mix would be helpful. You know, uh, we contracted our first internal tankage last year, um, and that'll come on this, that'll come on when these tanks come on in the fourth quarter. Um, we're very comfortable with that tankage. Uh, I've heard, and uh, we, I don't see us that, contracting any more internal tankage at Hardesty or Edmonton. Uh, we're comfortable with our position in the, in tankage right now, Matt. So as a mix, I would say, you know, majority of all those contracts at Hardesty are all with third parties, the big oil sense players and the downstream refiners. Um, and so you look at our contract life there, and it's, it's just under 10 years on our contract life remaining on all those contracts. And uh, so we really like the length of the contract. We really like the credit worthiness of all of our customers. Um, and, you know, that's what's providing that really stable infrastructure and income that you see quarter after quarter, Matt. Great. Thanks. That's it for me. Thanks for taking my question, Steve. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Lender Elsa Gallus with TD Securities. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, just wanted to build on this notion of defense versus offense, given your relative strength in the industry, and um, recognizing that the board has a, a lot of things to consider. Um, how might they consider timing a dividend increase before the historical uh, cadence, and conversely, what might uh, cause them to pause growing the dividend um, if they see um, outsized opportunities potentially or other considerations? Sean, I'll let you handle that. Thank you for the question, Linda. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for that, Linda. Um, you know, with respect to your defense versus offense question, you know, as you know, the dividend is is at the discretion of the board. Uh, we, we've made it pretty clear that, you know, with respect to annual increases, that we're going to look at it once a year uh, at the beginning of the year, as we did earlier this year. Really no changing in thinking has happened in around that. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I don't expect uh, that we'll review it again until early next year. Uh, with respect to, you know, what could cause an annual increase to pause, um, you know, when we increased our dividend earlier this year, we did make it quite clear that we see real benefit in an annual increase. You know, the, the quantum of that increase will be considered uh, with the board uh, in conjunction with what we see as our capital opportunities at that time. 
Um, you know, and we've been very clear that we're going to grow our dividend, or our plan is to grow our dividend with our infrastructure cash flows. Uh, we're adding three tanks at the end of the year, so the infrastructure cash flows will be growing. Uh, you know, as we look forward, though, to the extent that something were to pause future dividend increases, it would really be, you know, a pause in that infrastructure uh, segment profit growth. That's a helpful uh, context. Um, now, one of the other um, tenets of your um, financial strength as well has been um, a, a, essentially a self-funding model, uh, which at some point might constrain uh, your opportunities uh, if uh, tuck-in acquisitions do present themselves. I'm, wa I'm wondering what might prompt a deviation uh, of a self-funding model and um, how might uh, joint venture partnerships with financial investors um, instead of or on top of um, public uh, capital market accessing um, um, comprise part of your funding strategy at some point? Sean? Yep, you bet. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, no, uh, the self-funding model, Linda, is still very, very uh, much a tenet of our overall capital allocation philosophy. That's absolutely important to us. Um, you know, we have in our deck that, uh, if you look at the updated deck, uh, the, the sort of cash flow allocation slides, that, you know, with where we sit right now, we view that our self-funding capability to be well in excess of the 300 we expect to spend this year. So we actually expect to carry out funding capacity again into next year. Um, you know, for us not to be self-funded, it would really have to be something inorganic that would drive that, you know, given our guidance to 300 million of capital this year, two to 300 of next year, if anything, we're going to have excess capacity as we would currently model it. To the extent that there was an opportunity, uh, something opportunistic, as you noted, uh, that was absolutely on strategy for us. I think Steve answered that earlier with respect to whether or not, you know, that, that's been a focus for us. But to the extent that something like that did materialize, you know, absolutely we would look for, you know, any measure that would maximize returns to our shareholders to help finance that. But r right now we're really focused on organic growth. You know, as we look at spending $300 million this year, two to 300 next year, you know, we remain absolutely self-funded and with anything, you know, uh, excess funding capacity. Thank you. And maybe just a, a bigger picture question, uh, perhaps for Steve. Um, your uh, focus strategy has served you well the last number of years, um, but these are unprecedented times, not just for the industry, but arguably society. And I'm just wondering how uh, you're starting to think about potentially um, adjusting uh, the long-term strategy as it might relate to the types of uh, energy uh, that that you might um, uh, dabble in, let's say, or geographies or parts of the value chain uh, from an infrastructure perspective. So, you know, annually we kick off our strategy review um, and take a look at our strategy. Um, and we just started that review two weeks ago. And so really it's much more on a macro basis right now is, what are the opportunities out there? And we've talked to the board, and the board, and the board has been uh, supportive in looking at a broad. You know, they want us to look broadly across the opportunities. Uh, but again, just like you know, when I was talking to Jeremy, you know, that stability of cash flow uh, is what got us here. Uh, those conservative, uh, those conservative guideposts in our financial principles is what got us here. Uh, so, and we like the position we're in. You know, we've continued to deploy that 200 to 300 million dollars a year over the last three years, and we're confident to continue to deploy that 200 and 300 on high rates of return projects. These are those five to seven times EBITDA type projects. So, and you know, our creditworthiness of our customers continues to shine through. You know, even in these very trying times. So. We will look for other opportunities uh, along the way and see, you know, and see how we can expand that strategy. But right now, we're in the very early stages of that, Linda. Thank you for the context. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ian Gillis with Stiefel. The line is open. Morning, everyone. Uh, 
I wanted to go back to some of the comments around the opportunities at Edmonton. I was just curious if you think the opportunities around Grimex could potentially um, tie up all 2 million barrels of a potential storage that could be built at your site there. Yeah, we believe it could, right? Um, and that's a good thing for us, right? Because you're talking really long-term contracts. Uh, you're talking about the opportunity, um, you know, to, to do your, these investment-grade um, counterparties. Uh, and so we would love the opportunity to deploy, you know, let's say, you know, $150 million at, into our Edmonton asset um, or, or maybe or more, right? So, and with that, we also still continue to expand the rail capacity out of that. That is the facility has over 120 rail loading spots, all manifest, really that help support the local refiners and, and uh, exporting their, 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 their refined products into the market. So, and we continue to develop additional projects there. Uh, we, we did several last year, and we have several that we, we believe we'll contract this year and move forward with. So, and, and, and at the end, there are opportunities to buy land adjacent to us potentially and to continue to expand our terminal. Because of our connectivity, it would be more of a brownfield opportunity on the expansion. Thanks. That's that's helpful. And you hit on the next question I was going to ask with respect to uh, adjacent land. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is you've obviously started to dabble in the Midwest U.S. through an equity investment. I'm just curious around what you see with respect to business development opportunities in that region at this point in time. You know, that it's a tough, it's a, at this current time, that spread is pretty tight. And so really that's a rail arbitrage opportunity between our Edmonton and our Hardesty assets um, and our Moose Shaw facility. Um, but, you know, we, we, we kind of like that where the facility sits and how it sits. It really supports Canadian oil sands and, uh, and so we'll continue to work with our partner there, who, who is the commercial lead on that, to see if we can generate uh, more opportunities at that facility. Great. That's helpful. Thank you very much. I'll turn the call back over. Thank you. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, that's star one to ask the question. Our next question comes from the line of Matthew McKellar with RBC Capital Markets. The line is open. Thanks very much and good morning. Uh, this is Matthew on for Robert Kwan. Um, at Moose Jaw, can you please just uh, give us an update on your outlook for some of the key products there? I think you said the heavy end of the barrel. Uh, you'd see demand kind of tick upwards, but if you'd sort of run through your outlook by key products, including asphalt, roofing flux, drilling fluid, et cetera? Well, I'm, you know, I would say roofing flux is really kind of unchanged in its margin. Um, and then asphalt is a, a pretty typical year in its margin. Um, on the drilling fluid market, I would definitely agree. I mean, that has been challenged. Um, and then the lighter end product, um, um, the margins on that have been challenged. Um, but you kind of look at our second quarter earnings at Moose Jaw, and you look at what our third quarter earnings at Moose Jaw are going to be, and the reality is that they're going to be higher than the first quarter earnings. So, and that's just due to the marketing organization and doing opportunity buying of crude oil and utilizing the tankage both on the refined product side and on the crude oil side to really to really help generate revenue across Moose Jaw, even in these extremely trying times. We do believe that the, all, the, the markets will continue to open up um, in the third and fourth quarter, though especially on the on the on the asphalt and the roofing floor side. Great, thanks. Great. And then maybe as a follow up, um, just in the Permian, uh, could you please uh, give an outlook? I guess on what you're seeing right now in your existing assets, um, and then talk about maybe your plans for capital deployment as it stands today, versus uh, maybe how you were thinking about things pre-COVID. So. Um, First quarter to second quarter, actually our volumes increased across the two quarters. Uh, so 
you know, we're now moving um, more volume than we've ever moved through our asset, and that's because we've connected up additional wells in the quarter, and we connected up uh, additional producer in the quarter. We have uh, another producer that will connect up in September, um, and um, another and two and, and two connections there in Wink that will complete uh, in the third quarter. And then I would say probably for the rest of the year we'll probably be idle on capital. Um, but I, I still, you know, we've said that twenty-five to fifty million dollar CAD, and I believe we'll be able to spend that next year. Um, and just kind of the short expansions of the gathering system, uh, two, two new producers there, or existing connections, or tankage there at uh, Wink. Uh, so we're atypical to – we're not a typical crude oil gathering system. We don't wellhead connect. We do CDPs. And so with that, what that means is, is that – We'll go in and get an area dedication. Say we get an 80,000-acre area dedication with a drilling commitment on it. We'll, we'll put one or two CDPs on that, and then the producer lays into us because they have, they have the land rights to do that much more inexpensively than we do. And then uh, that also allows us not to have to continue to deploy capital just to stay in the same place. Great. That's all for me. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm not showing any further questions in the queue. I would now like to turn the call back over to Mark Hitches for closing remarks. Well, thank you.